Are we good to go? Great. Well, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be having an in-person but also a hybrid um, brown bag, which is part of the series at the Mandela School of Public Governance. My name is Dr. Marianne Camera. I'm a senior lecturer here and working with Professor Brian Raftopoulos, Mark Hayward, Dr. Hartley Gibriet, and others on on the democratic governance stream of our research at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. This brown bag discussion follows from a previous one we had on the 20th of July with um, Mark Hayward, who's also an adjunct professor at the school, and that was on social economic rights, social justice, public governance, exploring strategies for social accountability and rights. And Yesterday, as you know, the Mandela School falls within the University of Cape Town's commerce faculty. We had a very interesting interfaculty research seminar on addressing corruption and state capture, researching governance, ethics, power, trust, and accountability. And beyond our public governance, political economy approach at the school, it showcased research across the university from health sciences, from humanities, from engineering in the built environment, and from law, and confirmed, and this is what this meeting is about, particularly focusing on researchers and academics working in this space, that in addressing corruption and straight capture, the academy and researchers really need to adopt <clears throat> innovative, multi, cross and interdisciplinary approaches. And so the idea behind the brown bag was really to build on the extraordinary work which is already being done by academics in the field and by engaged policy researchers and journalists. And in front of me, I have a whole array of books um, of academics who've been leading the way. And I think we'd all agree that betrayal of the promise, which then resulted in shadow state, the politics of state capture, and this came out, remember, Betrayal of the Promise was before the Zondo Commission. It was in May 2017, and this book in 2018 was really connecting the dots and showing that what we are looking at was not a case of bad apples. This was a political project. And of course, that was before the Zondo Commission and its extraordinary um, process, which we are well, not all of us are familiar with, as we'll see from the attitude surveys, but um, this brown bag is ready to, to take note of the contributions which have already been made in this field and to open up new lines of inquiry for researchers with this, this incredible opportunity which the HSRC with CSIR is curating in terms of, of an online archive of the materials um, which are available. And so it's really to alert both emerging and established researchers to the existence of this online archive and that we start thinking as academics, as researchers working in this space, how to best mine it. And that's what Ferial Hafiji in her book, Days of Zondo, was really saying it's now, you know, Judge Zondo has done his job, the investigators have done their job, now it's up to researchers and academics to really dive deeper and, and excavate and mine this extraordinary resource. And then really to benchmark where we are, we're at the end of September 2023. We know that the report was released a year ago. The HSRC had a conference to mark that occasion and Justice Sonder was there and ruffled some feathers by some of the remarks that he made from his podium. But we need to keep the pressure up, quite frankly, in terms of making sure that the work that was done stays alive and that we can really harvest as much as we can as researchers. So it's my great pleasure to welcome four speakers from the Human Sciences Research Council's Development Capable and Ethical States Program. Um, our first speaker, Professor Narnia Bola Muller, will talk about really the opportunities presented by the Zondo Archive and, and what will this mean for policy and academic researchers working in this field. And what I'll do now is just briefly read the bios of our speakers so that we can get into the heart of the presentation and the discussion. So very briefly, Nadia, who has a doctorate in law, is divisional executive of the Developmentally Capable and Ethical States Program and a research fellow of the Center for Gender and Africa Studies at the University of the Free State with her research interests on international constitutional law, human rights, democracy, governance, 
And interestingly, in 2016, she was shortlisted as one of the 14 candidates for the position of the public protector. Following that presentation, we'll have Dr. Ben Roberts, who's sitting in the room with his colleague, Dr. Makpeli Nkunu, and they both will talk about the attitudes towards the Zondo Commission and how it's currently perceived by ordinary South Africans. They've been tracking this since 2021 20, through their, their surveys. Dr. Ben Roberts is the research director in the same um, DCES research division and is the coordinator of the South African Social Attitudes Survey Series. He has a PhD in social policy and labor studies from Rhodes University and has several book publications that um, he's referenced to. Ngapeli Mkulu is also a, a social science researcher with a passionate interest in corruption and governance. And he has worked both at the Public Service Commission um, while he was studying and has a Bachelor of Arts, an Honours degree, and a Master's in Social Science, majoring in Political Science from UKZN, with a very interesting focus on KZN's provincial government procurement and recruitment processes. And um, he's working on a number of different projects and is currently in the process of obtaining a PhD in Political Science at Stellenbosch University. Our third fourth speaker from the HSRC is someone I've known a long time, advocate Gary Pinner. I think we first met when you were the representative of the public protector in the Western Cape. And Gary will reflect really on the recommendations, where we are right now. He has almost a checklist approach. And I think that's a very interesting baseline, which we can all um, you know, use. And I have already um, in, in our work. So, as a senior research manager in the HSRC's DCES research division, specializing in constitutional and human rights, rights law, and before joining HSRC um, 10 years ago in 2013, he worked for EDASA, for the Open Society Foundation, and has also been the chair and board member of the ODAC, which was the Open Democracy Advice Center, um, and works currently serves on another forum chaired by the SIU and Corruption Watch. Following the inputs from the HSRC, and I'd really encourage you to hold your questions or put them in the chat. Our primary discussant will be Mr. Karam Singh, also known for a long time, who has will critically respond to both the HSRC um, inputs, but also from civil society's perspective. Corruption Watch has played a really important role in terms of policy research and advocacy. And Karam is the executive director of Corruption Watch, which is South Africa's leading NGO and on corruption issues. And he had previously been the head of legal and investigations and had also before that worked with the Open Society Foundation on access to justice initiatives and with the Human Rights Commission. And he too has a master's degree in constitutional and administrative law. And welcome to all of you. It's wonderful that you're all here. And so over to the speakers. I'm going to try and keep time, but because we're quite a small group and we want to have a conversation, let's see where we go. Um, I'm going to hand over to Narnia, if I may, um, who's joining us from from Pretoria. So over to you, Narnia. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, it's very good to be with you. Well, uh, not with you physically, but uh, here to share some of our, our research. It's uh, good to see my colleagues there with you in the room. And I'm very much looking forward to um, to sharing this, this presentation with you. Um, I don't know if anyone is going to be there we go okay um so you can go to the next slide i'm really going to speak very quickly so that i can give my colleagues an opportunity to um to share their research uh because this is an overview so we had a colloquium as was mentioned um first anniversary of the handing over of uh, the report first report to president ramaphosa um, but the colloquium is just one key outcome of a project being conducted by our research division at the Human Sciences Research Council. And we seek to continue the work of the Zondo Commission by recording the outputs of the commission to be housed 
in online and physical libraries accessible to everybody. So we're working with the commission to make sure that we get the data online and we get the data into a physical library um, so that researchers and ordinary people can go there and can look for information if they wish to do any research on the commission or merely want to know anything about the commission. We wish to examine and trace the implementation of the recommendations of the commission, which Gary will be speaking about, and then explore societal attitudes, not just to the outcomes of the commission, but to, the demo to democracy itself, which has come under threat as a result of um, the state capture initiative. Um, and the final outcome of the project will be a book on the future of democracy within the context of ongoing corruption. And some of you in the room will be authors um, of chapters in that book. Next page, please. Slide. Um, so implementation of recommendations, Gary will look at this in detail, um, but we do know that there were numerous recommendations that were made by the commission um, and that these recommendations uh, have, are now in the public domain for quite a long time, more than a year, um, and they must be seen to be implemented. It's a very important message. And justice must be seen to be served against those who have profited from the abuse of power and state capture. So we spent a lot of money on this commission, and we definitely need to see action. The public wants to see people being brought to book. As Feral Hafferty says, um, we want to see them wearing orange. Government has undertaken to implement certain remedial and corrective actions, but it remains to be seen how far these will go to curb corruption and further attempts at state capture. And Gary will speak about that again. If there is no swift action, citizens will lose patience with democracy. They're already losing patience with democracy. Trust in democracy has dropped dramatically in South Africa over the last 15 years. The consequences of which would be possible unrest, the elections are coming up, and low voter turnout in 2024. Next slide. Uh, the other part of the project is uh, perceptions of the commission. And there are some uh, interesting outcomes that uh, Ben and Kabeli will share with you. Um, overall confidence in the Zona Commission was measured by the extent that respondents felt that it, it had done a good or a bad job. Um, of those who heard of the commission before, now they actually it's quite a low number, you'll see. Of those who had heard of the commission before, 27% expressed satisfaction with the performance of the commission. 19% um, were discontent, while 54% were neutral or uncertain. I um, mean, this is different to what we've seen ourselves as, as researchers and as people who are interested in what is going on in our democracy. Satisfaction with the Commission's performance seems to be associated with its effectiveness in tackling crime and corruption, while discontent was linked to concerns about financial waste, bias, which is an interesting outcome, and delays in resolving cases. But of course, we know the Commission cannot implement its own recommendations. Next slide, please. So the data preservation, I want to speak about it with a little bit more. So with the help of the HSRC and the CSR, the commission um, is establishing two levels of data collection and also the Department of Science and Innovation who's supporting us. The one will be a library of all general documents, most of which have been used to write the commission's reports comprising of data that were transformed, interpreted and therefore usable. The second library, separate from the first, is for the 90% of the petabyte, um, which is still in rough form and has not yet been processed. Sophisticated tools are needed to mine the data, and that's why the CSR is on board with the HSRC. The millions of data sets that will accrue will provide huge opportunities for the country's researchers to mine for dissertations, theses, and articles. This is something, of course, we're interested in because we are researchers and academics. Many data scientists and data analysts could be trained to work with this data. Other sections of society are also geared up to working on the data 
Um, and so it should be processed and in a digestible form. Next slide. Um, given the 64,000 records that have been produced, comprising of affidavits, evidence, transcripts, statements, letters of request, exhibits, government and legal framework publications, applications for cross-examinations, postponements, recusals, and so on, it's massive. Um, this is all going to be online. So the HSRC is undertaking this recording process to preserve the information for access and reuse, and for the promotion of good governance, transparency, and accountability, which is actually what my research division focuses on. The present preservation of information is also being undertaken to promote efficient government operations and allow for the sharing of information across government programs. So to get rid of the siloed approach that we have. So I've mentioned the importance of discoverability and accessibility. Each record needs to be individually analyzed and all records have to be organized into a system. The system acquired by the HSRC through the CSIR um, is something called DSpace. Um, so in using best practice, the HSRC must index or use metadata elements to organize records in the system called DSpace based on international best practice. Approval has been obtained from the US Library of Congress to approve State Capture South Africa as an authorized subject heading. This has happened for everything, everyone in the world, you know, the US controls everything, of course. The national legal framework was also adhered to in the organization of the records, and this is ongoing. Also, each e-record is being linked to its equivalent print record. And we have a team within the HSRC who are very experienced with this and are working on a daily basis at the Commission's new offices in Pretoria. Currently, the team is digitally indexing the records, identifying duplicates, linking different record formats, and so on and so forth. Um, and when the custodians of the system, which is the Department of Justice, decide to make it accessible, it will be accessible. We believe that citizens should continue to demand transparency and access to official records and data to ensure that democracy remains vibrant and strong. Next slide. The CSR is assisting us, as I've mentioned, um, to host the online library. They are working on a dashboard and this dashboard will be uh, made public relatively soon, but we also have to be patient because this kind of work is time consuming. Um, and uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, everything is done according to the standards that are required um, for the uh, utilization of data. Next slide. So uh, Dr. Nzimandi made a comment at the colloquium. Uh, he encouraged his DGs to find money to support research into the report of the Zondo Commission. He also mentioned the TRC. And he promised, in a sense then, that the establishment of one or two research chairs using the National Research Foundation's resources. We have not, however, heard anything from the DSI since this announcement was made at the colloquium. Next slide. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me. Great. Thanks, Nanya. I was hoping you were going to say, and we have heard something. But I think part of our process here is just to say, and that's why, um, you know, what are the obstacles for, for doing research? Um, that was one of the titles in the questions we raised with this. We, we know about attitudes, opportunities, but are there obstacles? And, and I'd like us to think about that later. But thank you for, you know, just the good work that the HSRC is doing and making sure that the data is archived and accessible. So now, if we could hear from the social scientists, Ben and Penelope. Thank you. Um, so we're going to give a very short overview of a, a program of attitudinal research that was done between 2001 and late last year. Um, next slide, please. Um, by way of background, from an attitudinal point of view, in recent years, um, but for the most part over the last two decades, we've really seen growing public attention and concern um, to corruption. 
The sheriff's argument is that mentioned corruption is one of the dominant challenges facing society has grown from around 10% in 2003, it more than tripled by 2001 to 36%. So it's in the top five problems by 2021, and the late 22 figure was at 34%. So it's maintained at that level. This is really beginning to have an impact on perceived quality and performance of democracy, those kind of statistics that Narnia mentioned around general satisfaction of the functioning of democracy, we're also seeing its bearing on political behavior. So it's one of a very strong predictor of, of electoral behavior in particular. Um, as the Chief Justice has himself acknowledged, public perceptions are really crucial for a range of reasons. For understanding levels of public awareness and understanding on key societal issues and developments, for measuring confidence and trust in key processes such as the Rondo Commission, in identifying perceived levels of impact as well as effectiveness of those kinds, of, particularly commissions and inquiries and other institutional developments, but also ultimately with policy intervention in mind, making sure the public's needs and preferences are factored in. So the, the overarching aim behind this program of, or the subcomponent of the future of democracy research was to gain a conceptually grounded understanding of attitudes towards corruption, state capture, and the Zondo Commission as, as, as the process unfolded. Next slide. I'm not gonna bore you with methodological detail, just to say that we did um, four surveys over the interval that we looked at. It was a combination of nationally representative as well as uh, purposive online surveying. So in two consecutive years, in 21 and 22, we embedded a, an in-depth module in our annual South African Social Attitude Survey, it's representative of South Africans aged 16 years and older in private residence. And it's benchmarked to status age major population estimates, and we collected the data by means of face-to-face -face interviewing. Supplementing that, we actually did some non-probability convenience sampling, um, both in 2001 at the beginning of our surveying process, and most recently in June this year. Um, while it is purposive, um, it's into, what we were particularly looking for is going deeper into underlying motivations mm -hmm. behind why the public might hold certain viewpoints, and also to continue to test certain associations between um, attitude and uh, constructs. Next, please. So this is probably, depending on your eyesight, it's not the easiest to read. This is the conceptual framework that guided our study. And it draws um, particularly on the work that uh, uh, Tom Tyler did um, around a procedural justice model to understanding um, both um, the functioning of uh, the courts as well as, as other aspects of the criminal justice system. So we're quite keen to see to what extent it might work in the context of a commission of inquiry. Uh, just to give you a sense, so if you work from the left-hand side, depending which direction you're looking at the screen, to the right, so from the gray through to the yellow. So the starting point is one's personal uh, sociodemographic attributes, political uh, um, attributes, and also one's um, lived exposure to corruption. That will inform knowledge and awareness of state capture of the commission. Um, also perceived uh, perceptions around the scale of political corruption in the country and obviously imputed on political leaders themselves. Also has a bearing on uh, views on the perceived impact. Um, we also looked at, although that hasn't really made it so much in the public domain, views on the Zuma arrest. But that in particular had quite a decisive bearing on this attitudinal picture, particularly going back to what Narnia said about perceptions of fairness or unfairness. Um, um, those in turn would have a bearing on two constructs. One is different aspects of trust in the commission, which would include particularly um, perceived effectiveness of the commission, and both distributive and procedural fairness in practice. And the second part is around the perceived legitimacy, which is really about shared moral alignment, shared moral values, a sense of duty to respect the outcomes and decisions of the commission. And these two in turn, we believe, would shape overall confidence in the commission, including um, evaluations of what it valued for money. And that in turn would inform um, one's position on different outcomes. That could include prosecution, progress therein, could be about views on 
uh, overcoming corruption in society, also views of around specific types of recommendations, whistleblowers, head of deployment emanating from, from the commission report. Um, so that's what we thought would, uh, the model that would hold building on uh, this procedural justice model of Thailand and its colleagues. And so as with what I'm okay, you'll do is just give you a snapshot of certain elements in that model to give you a, um, an overview of whether it does indeed apply or not in the South Bank case. I'm just curious. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so one of the first things we tried to look at was whether or not um, everybody with regards to the impact um, of uh, state capture. And what we found is that our concerns regarding the impact ranged uh, between the 35 to 45 percent. And there was also concerns that not enough was being done to um, prosecute uh, those who are implicated in the state capture reports. And we saw an increase in the level of discontent of nearly 10 percent between 21 and 2022. Next slide, please. Um, so back on that one, yeah, awesome. Yes, uh, then we also wanted to evaluate knowledge. Um, and what we found is that the levels of knowledge, uh, that are uh, reported by our participants was quite moderately high, uh, between 35 and um, 45 percent. But we also realized that there was also kind of limited amount of knowledge. Uh, with nearly about 40 percent in the case that they did not um, have enough knowledge. However, there was a strong correlation between uh, the levels of awareness uh, of, of the commission and potential um, impact. So, if one is aware of the commission, they are more likely um, to be of its impact as well. Next slide, please. So now we're going to look at trust uh, in the commission, particularly with regards to its effectiveness and fairness. Next. So what we wanted to try and find out when, when it comes to uh, the per perceived fairness of the commission related to a couple of things, including, for example, the gathering of evidence of corruption, it is not an easy project to undertake. So does it important for us to assess whether or not people felt they were done properly. And what we found is that there was an uh, equal share of our respondents who, who, who argued that it was not done properly, and also others who said that it was done properly. And those who negatively evaluated it between 2021 and 2022, uh, there was a slight increase. Um, however, I think what is most important uh, to note here is that this particular issue was a strong determinant of how one overall is likely to evaluate uh, the commission. So if one believes that they didn't do a good job in terms of collecting evidence, they will overall negatively evaluate the commission. Next slide, please. Now, the issue of time was quite uh, prominent in, in the public discourse, especially with the number of years the, the commission ran for. And we did find in our analysis that people were critical about the time it took to complete uh, the, the commission um, overall. However, this was not necessarily a negative, um, um, there was a, there was a good predictor of whether or not the commission performed well. So whilst there were, there were concerns regarding how long it took, citizens were far more likely to justify those um, that duration. So they say, for example, that process of gathering evidence takes time and uh, some of the witnesses were hiding evidence. So we found that yes, they thought it took long, but it was a justifiable um, delay. Next slide, please. And of course, fairness was always going to be an important part of our, our commission because, of course, there's a lot at stake. Um, and what we found is that citizens were likely uh, to provide a, a, a rather negative um, assessment with regards to fairness than a positive one. However, we also um, found that you know, the public was quite split. Um, it wasn't uh, unanimous, so there wasn't any consensus on, on, on the procedural fairness. And um, perception, so one view on, on fairness and procedural or distributive 
will far more likely to affect uh, the overall evaluation of um, the commission's performance. Next slide, please. Uh, we're now looking at uh, legitimacy from a public opinion standpoint. So firstly, the most important um, issue we look to study is the moral alignment. So is there a moral alignment between the citizens and the proceedings at, at the commission? We found that uh, about 33% felt that there was a, a sense of shame or value, so they agreed with the positions that the commission um, had taken. And then, importantly, this is double the share of uh, those who said that there wasn't an alignment or misalignment. So 33% said that there was an alignment, 16 said there was a misalignment. And an additional 30% or so uh, felt that the, the sense of more shared value with the commission was likely to affect its overall um, positive valuation. We did not know these results are going to save some time. We also then look at the duty. So usually we talk of duty, we talk about duty to vote, for example. But here we wanted to understand is there a duty to follow the, 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 the recommendations made by the commission because that would ultimately affect its um, legitimacy in the eyes of the public. We found that all of those who heard the commission or we had um, identified or said that they know a lot about the commission, 32% said that there was a sense of duty, uh, there was a need to support uh, the commission, and 19% disagreed, so it's uh, less than a quarter. However, we saw in 2022, there was a much stronger sense of duty following the, the release of the entire report. So I think it could be that as the proceedings were going on, uh, people may have um, lost attention. However, upon the release of the results and the extent to which um, the, the State Chapter Commission had investigated, there was a stronger uh, alignment or sense of duty uh, to support the recommendations. Next slide, please. Now we're going to assess our uh, overall confidence within the totality of the commission. Um, so one of the key indicators we used here was the good job, bad job evaluation. So we wanted to understand better if citizens or participants believe that uh, the commission did a good or bad job. Uh, over a quarter, about 27% indicated that uh, they were satisfied with the implementation of the commission and 19% uh, were, were, were said to be uh, dissatisfied with discontent. And of course, uh, quite a significant number were either neutral or uncertain. What we also found is that the commission uh, and certification of how the commission performed is closely uh, associated with its effectiveness in, in, in um, tackling corruption and crime. So if one believes that the commission did a good job, they are more likely to believe that it will be effective in tackling corruption and crime. While as um, those who are discontent or dissatisfied with the commission had cited reasons such as bias um, or financial waste and delays in resolving uh, cases. Next slide, please. So uh, we then refer the open ended responses where we look at some of the reasons advanced uh, for either negative or positive evaluations of the, of the performance of the commission. So about 32% have indicated that the commission did a good job primarily because it exposed corruption in the truth. Um, while there's a further 26% indicated that the commission was impartial and those who were guilty were, were held accountable. While as we're looking at the negative side, we found that some of the reasons advanced by those who believe that it did a good job um, have to do with the fact that the guilty are not held accountable and arrested as yet. But of course, we know that is not necessarily within the prerogative of the commission. Um, and others have cited unfairness, so procedural unfairness, and one of the, the last one was the wa wastage of taxpayers' money. Next slide, please. So we had uh, we then listed a couple of predictors regarding the confidence of the commission. So here we've got a couple of uh, corruption perceptions, also knowledge of the capital commission. So if one believes that enough has been done uh, to prosecute those who who are involved in state capture, they're more likely to provide positive evaluation of the commission. 
So all the track measures were had strong predictors as well. So track measures includes the procedural fairness, the computer fairness, and the effectiveness. Uh, the same goes with the legitimacy. So this includes treatment to support and moral alignment. This therefore confirmed the procedural justice model that uh, Ben had talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So we then have views on um, outcomes and implementation. Of course, that has been in the public domain for, for quite a while. So we then asked our respondents what do they think is going to happen when looking towards the future. Uh, we asked them, we found that over the, uh, 35 percent believe that there would be prosecu uh, prosecutions to follow uh, post the commission. And we found that people were more likely to concur with that view that there will be prosecutions, particularly if one believed that the commission had done a good job. Um, also, from a positive evaluation standpoint, we saw that people were likely to say that this commission may be able to impact or affect corruption reduction in the future. And the commission was, in fact, uh, money lost states were provided with a value for money. Next slide, please. We then looked at the uh, recommendations or implementation of the recommendations, what right, the citizens think uh, is going to happen. We found that um, over a quarter, about 32 percent, we're optimistic um, that the uh, commission's findings were going to be implemented, while 19 percent remain skeptical. Uh, in the online survey we just concluded, we're currently analyzing, uh, we find that there is a bit of a, a, a a polarized view between uh, those who are optimistic and those who are skeptical. And uh, some of the open-ended analysis that we are currently undertaking has positive views linked to political will, trust in political uh, processes. So if one believes that uh, political processes are trustworthy, they're likely to believe that the commission's findings will be implemented. And the negative assessments really have to do with the fact that um, some respondents believe there's a lack of accountability for those who are not found, uh, for those who are found guilty, there's also not, uh, there's a lot of empty promises and no political will to oversee the um, recommendations. Next slide, please. And I'll hand over to Ben for the conclusion. Yeah, that's been a real barrage of numbers and text. Uh, I know your heads re are reeling, um, but just a few summary points. I think the surveying, uh, the survey evidence that we've presented has provided so far the more, more most detailed evidence on perceptions of the Commission and expectations of outcomes. Um, as Napelli indicated, the procedural justice model does seem to apply to Commission evaluations, both in terms of the bearing that trust and legitimacy have on overall confidence in the Commission, and that that confidence that's vested in the Commission in turn seems to shape views on. Uh, beliefs around outcomes in terms of success in implementation, arrest, prosecutorial action, and ultimately winning the fight against state level uh, corruption. The public tends to be complimentary about the Commission's gathering of evidence, but the sort of fundamental risk that we see in all those numbers is, and it's one that Narnia alluded to, is if the prosecution continues not to meet public expectations, mm -hmm. we're starting to see a recursive loop. We start to see a harsher retrospective view of the Commission emerging. And Penny talked about how some of those attitudes have started dropping uh, between 21 and 22, and that is linked to the views on prosecution and progress therein. So this raises, and it's, it will, is likely in the public imagination to raise questions of its ultimate value, but importantly of the value of future commissions of inquiry. Next, please. And uh, I think, like many of you are probably wondering, we're having a lot of internal debate about this. But the, the, given the scale of attention given to state capture, to the Zondo Commission activities, it remains quite remarkable that awareness is so circumscribed. And this seems to play out in the divided nature of opinion that we see regarding the performance of the Commission, with a significant share of the respondents expressing even uh, ambivalent or uncertain views. Uh, this is also reflected in growing institutional mistrust that we've seen. It's a very profound change in our country over the last 10 to 15 years. And about uh, democratic performance as a whole after nearly 30 years of democracy in the country. So really the successful implementation of the Commission recommendations is crucial for maintaining and promoting faith and justice in the hearts and minds of South Africans. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for being there. Um, um, I mean, as you say, is the most comprehensive and hard to suppress evidence of how South Africans are perceiving the commission. And then, and of course, you've drawn it out to what the impact would be. And, and I, I mean, I think the procedural justice model is definitely useful as a, as a framing. But we'll go on to Gary, and we've got a couple more speakers, and then we'll open up for discussion. Great. Thank you. All right, so Ben and Vincent have talked about how perceptions of the Commission are linked to implementation of its outcomes, so its recommendations. So what we've tried to do is, is track what action is being taken. Um, and that we, we use, of course, as the baseline two primary documents, the President's response in October last year to the Commission's uh, recommendations and the undertakings given in that response, and then also Parliament's response. Uh, Parliament is overseeing the government's response, but it also undertook to do certain things itself. So uh, I tried to find evidence of action um, and let's see where this takes up. Next slide, please. This is just a call from retail that, um, you know, even in the heady days of the birth of a new democracy in the USA, there was an awareness that the human condition is always with us. Next slide, please. Um, the Commission made three findings about the mechanisms of exit capture. Um, and it was the strategic positioning of politically connected individuals in positions of power um, through the abuse of appointment and dismissal processes, the control and manipulation of public procurement, financial, and contracting processes by those people, uh, which was bolstered by capturing of uh, the law enforcement and tax administration institutions, so the APA and SARS, to protect them from sanction. Next slide, please. So the, the, we're just uh, picking up one of those threads now. The ability to place politically connected people on boards and in key posts in the public administration was the essential mechanism. Um, and that was possible because of the failure to implement section 195 of the constitution, which talks about the qualitative components of what the public administration should be. So they, they should be professional, they should be impartial, they should focus on the development of the country rather than self-benefit. And so we saw um, the dubious appointments and removals, um, and this was all possible um, because of the non-compliance with section 195 among other things, and the, the playing out of cronyism and tailored deployment, which the commission found to be unlawful and unconstitutional. Uh, I saw that there was a, a news report this morning that the DA wants the Secretary General of the ANC to be arrested for contempt because they have not yet handed over the records of the courts of state. They should hand over regarding the uh, activities of the ANC the deployment committee. Um, I'm not sure I understand why they're doing that right now, because although, although the ANC is late in lodging its appeal with the concourse, um, it can still request and be granted condemnation for its lateness. So I think the call for a red for contempt might be, it seems to me, premature. Next slide, please. Um, this the lack of compliance led to the Commission to make a couple of recommendations associated with it. First of all, it called for truly independent and transparent appointments processes for senior people in the, uh, the public sector based on merit, and they then recommended the establishment of a standing committee to do this, to ensure that these processes were indeed independent and transparent. So it suggested an oversight committee to ensure that uh, there was uh, professional, reputational, and eligibility requirements respected in the process. Recently, in one of his 
a weekly letter to the nation. President Ramaphosa said the SOE bill will improve oversight, transparency, and accountability, but we need to see the bill really in, in uh, landing in Parliament that hasn't been yet approved by the cabinet, so we don't yet know what's really going to be there. Next slide, please. Um, the Commission also recommended a number of uh, financial management and audit reforms. So, first of all, it said that SOEs uh, need to be audited by either the Auditor General or selected audit firms with the requisite capacity. So, not just any audit for, um, firms, but those that have the capacity to take on a large scale audit, a complex audit. Although there's a caveat, of course, that we know that some audit firms, even those blue chip audit firms, who did perhaps uh, play a role in auditing some of these large entities, um, didn't always live up to their professional responsibilities. Um, there was also a recommendation by the Commission that accounting officers, so basically DGs and HODs, should be protected from criminal or civil liability for their efforts to hold the line. Um, so even if there was irregular expenditure, sometimes it's for a good reason. Um, there's an effort to save money, or there's a refusal to do certain things that amount to um, unlawful instructions. They should be prevented from, uh, from, from either civil or criminal liability. The Auditor General is reported to be reviewing usefulness of the concept of irregular expenditure, which is a very technical definition. Doesn't look at the substance of what is being done, just looks at the technicality. Did you follow the procedure? And so, it's not a very helpful measure of actual conduct and performance and whether or not it's for a legitimate purpose. So, I think that's uh, an interesting space to watch. We haven't heard anything about progress in that regard. But the Public Service Amendment Bill, which has been tabled in Parliament a few months ago, does have a clearer delegation of administrative and financial responsibilities to the accounting officers. So I think that's an important step forward um, because there has been a tension at the fiscal administrative interface where we've had executive authorities, so ministers or ABCs, interfering with what accounting officers should be doing. And there, is, um, there, there are legal um, areas of, of confusion and conflict that need to be clarified. Um, so in the Public Service Act and the PFMA there are conflicting instructions about what executive authorities and, and accounting officers can or should do. So this legislation and others will hopefully clear that up, clear, clarify the lines of accountability and responsibility, so that there is no political meddling. Um, we'll look at other legislation in, in the coming slides. Uh, next slide, please. So the other very important thing that we need to watch is the professionalization of the public administration. Um, so we, we've seen that a key mechanism of state capture was the abuse of appointments and rules by political authorities, so the executive authorities. <clears throat> um, they should not be involved in this protest. These powers should be clearly delegated to a professionalized public administration headed by council officers um, and that should reduce some of the tension from the political administrative interface. Um, so there, there should be a, this clear line, this clear open water between these functions. There should also be regular ethics and governance training, for example, by the Public Service Commission and by the National School of Government. And there should also be other measure, measures um, implemented, such as lifestyle audits, which have started although they've not yet been fully rolled out to all departments um, nationally and provincially. And there's an element here of psychometric integrity testing. So um, before you get promoted or before you're appointed, there should be an element of this uh, integrity testing. And the, so there's a question here about whether or not this is legitimate in terms of the labor relations good practice. Um, so we'll have to see what form this integrity testing takes. Next slide, please. So, picking up or pursuing the idea of professionalizing the public administration, um, cabinets in October last year adopted the national framework towards professionalization of significantly the 
public sector, not just the public service. So this is a broader concept, and it includes what um, uh, includes local governments, which will be drawn in through um, the public administration management amendment bill, which was has also been tabled in Parliament, and also uh, it includes um, state-owned entities. So not just SOEs, but people like us, the HSRC and the CSIR, um, they, these, these standards ought to apply to us as well. But the conflicting decision about the ANC at its policy conference um, in December, January last year, you recall it was not finalized in December, and its resolution was adopted only in January this year. But they retained head of deployment as their official policy. Um, and so we need to see who wins out here because this national uh, framework for professionalization is just a policy framework. It's not law. Um, so will what, what authority will that have in practice? And will it override the ANC's party policy? And will the legislation that is coming, um, including the PAMA, including the PSA Amendment Bill, including the PSC, the Public Service Commission Amendment Bill, which has just recently this month been approved by Cabinet, but hasn't been tabled in Parliament yet, but which um, is critical for the ability of the Public Service Commission to supervise and manage these senior level appointments. Because it will, the PSC amendment will do, among other things, two important things. It will confirm in law what the Constitution provides, and that is that the PSC is independent. So for all this time, the Public Service Commission has been supported by a government department. The Office of the Public Service Commission is a government department. And so that undermines the independence of the PSC, but the bill promises to rectify that that lacuna, that, that gap. Um, but it would also um, legislate an important part of the national framework for professionalization, and it will allow the Public Service Commission to supervise and oversee recruitment and appointments of senior public servants um, and, and people in the public sector. As the, including SOEs. So this bill, the question is, is there enough time before this parliament prorogues, before the next election, to pass these, these pieces of legislation? So when it comes to the new seventh administration, what will we see? Head of deployment or professional uh, appointments according to the, the national framework? So that's a space to watch. Next slide, please. So public sector governance, and this, so this is a very encouraging move. What was initial uh, a draft framework developed by uh, the DPSA and the National School of Government and the PSC was adopted by cabinet. And it does support the idea of the Independent Public Service Commission coordinating and overseeing recruitment and selection. Importantly, on merit, and that's the overriding criteria. Also, this framework identifies what is already present in practice, the head of the public, the public administration. So what we have at the moment is, as you've seen, um, executive authorities, so government ministers and ABCs, premiers appointing high-level staff in departments. What will now happen is that the, and, and also then in managing their career incidents, as it's called, so their promotion. So basically, if you don't turn the the line, you have a dead end for, for your career. Um, and we've seen the manipulation of appointments and removals identified by the Zondo Commission. So what happens now is this head of public administration who has already been appointed um, as, and it is the DG and the presidency who is the, is the person, and it's also the premiers um, in the provinces that person will now be in charge of taking the final decision for recruitment, promotion, and dismissal. So once these people are appointed on the recommendation of the PSC supervised process, these senior public servants are now accountable to the head of the public administration. And that head of public administration 
where there's two hats. One of them is the DG in the presidency nationally, and the other one is the DG in the premier's office in each province. So it's important to see how this will play out in detail, but at least there are clearer delegations to country offices, and they will then be able to appoint their own staff, so the DDGs um, and their deputy heads of departments. The, the, the senior staff that they need as their team to implement their policy. Um, Okay, so the other important things in the legislation in Parliament is that these accounting officers and their immediate subordinates are prohibited from holding senior office in political parties, and there's a clearer prohibition on business with the state. And anyone in every any public service involved in supply chain must serve a one-year pre-law period before they can move to employment in the private sector. So I think that's a longer way to uh, move. Next slide, please. The Commission recommended that SOE employees and officials implicated be prosecuted or subject to discipline. Some of this has started in, in the form of uh, prosecutions and some consequence management has called disciplinary action. We haven't seen really much of substance in terms of results yet, but we have seen that some compulsory lifestyle orders have begun to take place, but not uniform, uniformly. The NPA and the Hawks are participating in an integrated task force regarding prosecutions, President Ramaphosa and, and the NBA regularly report on their progress. President Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa in his uh, recent letter on the 14th of August, said, described this as significant progress, but really nobody in orange overalls yet. Next slide, please. Um, the part of the challenge facing the public sector is that there isn't a centralized register of public servants and public officials. And so they are still free to resign before the conclusion or initiation of disciplinary processes. And so they can still go move and look for employment in another part of the state. This centralized register is being developed, but uh, it's supposed to be rolled out in April. I've not yet found any trace of, um, of this happening. Next slide, please. Anti-corruption agency critical recommendation by the Zombie Commission. Um, it's on the uh, National Advisory Council's agenda. Um, the plan was due in April, but they say it's probably going to be tabled in December. Um, at the moment, what we have is the Minister of Justice still, in terms of the Constitution and the MPA Act, exercising final responsibility of the NPA. So the NPA is not itself a, a permanent anti-corruption commission. Um, and the, it doesn't yet meet the Stern's criteria um, established by the Constitutional Court. And Marianne reminded me just recently about the Jakarta principles, which are to similar effect. So the Stern's criteria really are, they say that they, they are the criteria to decide whether or not it, the, an anti-corruption agency is independent and effective. Um, I won't go into now, we can talk about it later. I mean, in the meantime, though, and just recently, earlier this month, uh, Cabinet approved uh, the draft NPA amendment bill, which will, will make the, in the, in the investigating directorate permanent inside the NPA. It's been as evidenced by presidential fiat at the moment. Um, and it will have a powers akin to the scorpions of prosecution led investigations. Next slide, please. I'll try and make it in the next few minutes, Mary. One minute. One minute. Okay. So there, there will be greater responsibility for the president and premier to hold their subordinates and their officials, uh, their subordinates accountable. Um, the president said, well, they're already responsible and accountable in terms of the Constitution and the Executive Member's Ethics Act and Code. Uh, next, and, and their oath of office. Uh, next slide, please. But as we've seen, that has not been effective. Um, so we need more. What is the more? Uh, next slide, please. So the Commission recommended that there should be a criminal offense for abuse of power. Because what we've seen so far is not yet effective. And President Ramaphosa's response last year was to say, okay, 
I'm asking the DOJ to look into this and um, study it's the possibilities of a new statutory offence and the results are due in December. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a criminal case for uh, abuse of power, and the same for public representatives who fail to exercise their power. So not just abusing it, but not using it. Similarly, DOJ has been tasked to look into this and report back by December this year. Next slide, please. Um, and so that we, we have been the idea of parliamentary oversight over the presidency. Um, two recommendations made. First of all, over the presidency and over other government departments, two measures recommended. First of all, a constituency based system was recommended by the Zombie Commission. Uh, Parliament said no, not yet, at least. So the act that was passed earlier this year doesn't yet establish that model. But the act does provide for a review panel to be appointed to yet again look into our electoral system and explore the possibility. Um, of a constituency based or a mixed system. And um, I have seen evidence of a, a call for nominations for, uh, for um, starting in this panel. So we'll see what they come up with. I think they've got a year after the next elections to come up with a plan, a recommendation. And also the parliament should um, protect MPs from losing their job if they don't um, uh, toe the party line during oversight. Um, the Speaker of Parliament basically said, well, there's enough protection already in the Constitution and in the, the Powers and Privileges Act. And uh, clearly we've seen that that's not the case because people are moved on. Um, so we do need that protection. Next slide, please. Um, and so the, the other recommendation was an oversight committee of the Parliament, of the Presidency. Uh, there was a study tour that was undertaken in July. As promised, uh, we've yet to hear a report back from them. The other recommendation was more opposition party representatives chairing portfolio committees as they do chair the scope and parliament has basically rejected that. Next slide, please. I think I'm coming to the end. And let's see. So the next is public procurement reform. And I think two important things here, lots of recommendations made, but essentially um, uh, to increase accountability and ethics in the profession. Um, and also the next slide is an, an independent uh, public procurement agency. And that's now also on NACAC's agenda. Uh, their plan, again, probably due at the end of the year. Um, and the, it was due in April, but I think this is quite a complex thing. They're looking at NACAC is um, the entire country's anti corruption architecture. So it's not just these individual things, but the entire architecture. So, because these things are connected, I think we can understand why there's a little complexity. And so, it's it's due, uh, I think, a little bit later than, than initially hoped. Next slide, please. Um, I think we're at the end. This is the third. What we have had landing in Parliament is the Public Procurement Bill. Um, it's really not providing for an independent anti corruption agency, possibly because. NACAC is yet to advise on what form our architecture should take, but it has been criticized because this um, public procurement office will be in the national treasury, so it's not independent. Um, it doesn't achieve one of the main recommendations of the Zondra Commission, which is harmonization of standards. It really has a hodgepodge of recommendations, which is what we have at the moment. And it's what we, the spaghetti that we have at the moment is what has allowed the delegation, these discretions have been abused for public procurement misconduct. And this, I think the same will follow if this bill is passed as is. But if the bill does have significant transparency commitments. And so let's hope those that like that can are implemented. And I think let's, uh, I mean to see what's on the next slide, please, and let's see if we can give it a list. Oh, yes, protection for whistleblowers, very important. <laughs> uh, we can't give this a list. Um, the DOJ did in, in July this year publish a discussion paper. It had some really strong recommendations in it. Um, they, it was open for public comments until the end of July. It has some interesting ideas, such as the, the, the current uh, Protective Disclosures Act has been criticized for very narrow definitions 
and protecting us for whistleblowers in the workplace only. Now it looks at detrimental action, which is, has a far greater scope beyond the workplace. Um, it it looks at a protection fund for whistleblowers, a defense fund to fund, uh, if they fund them if they are uh, pursued legally, as well as potential rewards or incentives for whistleblowers. Um, and also, the President Ramaphosa has said um, that there will be a criminalization of threats against whistleblowers. They do have some protections in the PDA and in the Harrison Act and the Companies Act, but what we need to see is much stronger standards. So I think let's call it quits there, Marianne. No, thanks, Thank Gary. And I mean, I think you have tracked the recommendations and where we are with them, and it's a lot of law reform. <laughs> and so if you're interested in law reform, but the, each one of those areas is a rich resource for, for researchers. And so how do we track the recommendations more effectively as academics and researchers, but also civil society? And so our first discussant is Karam Singh, who is Executive Director of Corruption Watch, who's been doing this. So Karam, if you could just respond yeah. briefly and, and think about the areas. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks very much. Maybe just turn your face um, a little bit. Um, I think it was a better yeah. I mean, you're talking to us. Apologize for that. No um, thanks very much to the Nelson Mandela School and to Marianne for this opportunity. And big congratulations to the HSRC and the CSIR for a very successful uh, 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 symposium, uh, colloquium, um, and for the you know the research that's been done to date and the building of this archive. I think it's going to be really exciting. Um, obviously, from Corruption Watch, those of you who don't know, Corruption Watch is a civil society organization. It's been around for 11 years with the South African chapter of Transparency International, which is a global international uh, anti corruption movement. And obviously, we sort of come at this from a slightly different perspective from a civil society, uh, primarily an advocacy perspective as opposed to a, a research perspective, although these things are obviously quite closely linked. So um, in terms of my speaking notes, I've got four headlines. One is general comments, two briefly on Zondo Commission current events, which I think is an important context in terms of understanding where we are and what we're up against. Um, just briefly commenting on some of the issues raised in Gary's presentation, um, and then um, just a discussion briefly on some of the key activities for Corruption Watch and civil society going forward. So just a general comment, and you know, this has been with me, and I've said this in different forums over the years. Um, three years of hearing, one year of writing the report um, following the Zondo Commission, um, and nothing is binding. You know, there's this kind of deep irony that, that, that one feels about uh, the nature of the Zondo Commission, given that we would have never got to the commission if it wasn't for a finding of constitutional reports that. Um, the findings of the public protector are binding. Uh, uh, so, you know, we, we, we have the commission as a result of the powers of the constitutional body, and then the powers of this commission are, are limited, uh, and their recommendations are not binding. And for me, this feeds into a long, uh, what I would call an accountability deficit that we have in the country, particularly related to the work of commissions of inquiry. So I think there's a, a story to be told, particularly around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, the fact that it wasn't a Truth and Justice Commission, and the fact that the prosecutions were in fact uh, stymied uh, following that commission uh, because of uh, the Mbeki administration and, and a fear that we're falling into this very similar track. Similarly, if you look at the Marikana Commission, uh, again, very little accountability. Even the Sariti Commission uh, was eventually thrown out as a result of a judicial review challenge uh, with corruption one being one of the named litigants there. So then it leaves me with a question that, you know, around the species of a commission of inquiry, uh, is a commission of inquiry the only institutional mechanism available to us when traditional spheres of power or governance uh, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary are unable to process allegations of grand corruption. Uh, I think we need to be able to think, we need to think about another model in order to, if, if accountability is what we're really after. Um, are we not back uh, as, in, in a way, haven't become full circle and we're back to where we started? Uh, before the Zondo Commission, 
uh, uh, and where we ended with the Glenister litigation in terms of needing a comprehensive, independent law enforcement capacity to fight corruption, which currently we don't have. We arguably live, it, we continue to live in an era of state capture, albeit partial, uh, and um, we're not going to get another commission of inquiry. Uh, uh, the public sentiment won't support that, the, the investment's not available, so we, we need something else. So will state capture 2.0 finally give us the Scorpions 2.0 question? <laughs> so briefly on Zondo Commission current events, and you know this came up as I was looking into this, so three things that came up uh, in the recent uh, legal forensics headline. One, we're still trying to extradite the Guptas. Two, implicated persons in state capture are getting government jobs. And three, there are at least 12 different applications for dish for a judicial review challenging the findings and recommendations of the Zondo Commission. So briefly on extraditing the Guptas, uh, in the New Lane investment case, the first state captured matter to go to court, the prosecution charged that more than two, 20 million rand swindled out of the free state government was laundered through bank accounts linked to the Guptas uh, uh, traveling to Dubai. Um, Based upon the expedition request on charges of money laundering and in the Estina dairy farm uh, documents were submitted to the UAE, uh, the extradition did not happen and Guptas were allowed to leave the UAE. One of the key, key questions for the Department of Justice that they are now asking the UAE in their new application uh, um, is, is whether the UAE will pursue charges against the Guptas. Um, if pursuing the second expedition bid seems optimistic, officials have said there is reason to insist on this because wherever in the world they may be, the UAE remained the main base for the Gupta's business operation. So um, no accountability, uh, we can't even get the Gupta's uh, uh, before court. Seeking to undo the report, the legal challenges, um, it's been reported that Arthur Frazier, Gwede Maltash, uh, 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 Marcella Coco, uh, Lucky Montana, Sefiso Butelezi are amongst implicated individuals who've launched court applications against the commission's findings. Um, and the story was that Judge Zondo doesn't even know uh, how uh, the state attorneys are going to uh, um, fight these cases because nobody's been appointed to deal with them. So big question mark. And then the third current event, impunity and jobs for implicated persons. In a disconcerting turn of events, Des Van Royen, our uh, weekend special, and, and, and Papa Leshebane, uh, who, is, who worked for Basasa, uh, have recently been appointed to lucrative board positions in the Gauteng government. Um, uh, Papa Lashabane at Kaltang Tourism Authority and Mr. Van Royen at the Kaltang Enterprise Propellant. Um, so, you know, questions, um, you know, not only have these guys not been prosecuted, but they continue to benefit from, from government largesse. Um, so then turning to some of the issues that Gary spoke about, uh, Gary spoke about stabilizing state-owned enterprises, about financial management and audit reforms, about the professionalization of the public service, about the anti-corruption agency, about um, new offenses, about legislative oversight, public procurement reform, whistleblower protection. And I don't think you got to a slide on the private sector. So on, on the financial management and audit reforms, um, I did attend a very interesting conference that National Treasury held last week, very much on this topic. Um, Fantastic presentation from the Auditor General. I think we're still in, in very good hands at the AG, and I think you know we, we need to continue to think about how we can support the work of the AG and how we can close that link between audit findings and then consequence management. Um, you know, the, the concern that one has looking at these issues around financial management reform is what's happening in local governments. And this is really where the big where the big gap is. And there was a lot of talk about um, various kinds of initiatives to look at the MFMA. And that leads me then directly into the issue around procurement reform. We've got a public procurement bill, which has been around for many years in different form. The current bill, uh, we commented on it in 2020. And then around this time last year, we saw that there was a new bill 
Uh, we were fortunately invited along with Parry and the African Procurement Law Unit at Stellenbosch into the NEDLAC negotiations as a joint strategic resource. And we, we, we really tried to hit them hard to you know, hit this bill, say this bill is not fit for purpose. It doesn't do enough on accountability. It doesn't do enough on transparency, you know, particularly around obligations to publish procurement data at different stages. It doesn't do enough on enforcement. It's misaligned with them. It's on their recommendations. Um, despite that, Treasury uh, took a version of the bill to cabinet, and now the bills come before parliament. And all of those criticisms have now emerged in the parliamentary uh, hearings, which took place last week. Uh, that sort of segues me into the then question around whistleblower protection and support. And particularly on this very specific issue around incentivizing whistleblowing, because it comes into the discussion on procurement reform, because there's this very kind of active idea that if whistleblowers are instrumental in government recovering assets as a result of irregular procurements, there should be a system whereby those whistleblowers could be re rewarded. This is something which exists in other jurisdictions, particularly in the US, what's called the pre tam system. Uh, Parry in particular have done a lot of great research on this. National Treasury didn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. They said it's that's not it's beyond our remit. It's for the Department of Justice. And despite lots of research that's been done, the Department of Justice did not produce a white paper. Uh, on whistleblower protection and reform, they produced a research paper, which was interesting. As Gary said, it's got lots of good stuff in it, lots of kind of tentative support for different types of recommendations on the basis that we don't have currently have a system of whistleblower protection and support. We have a system around protecting disclosures, primarily in the workplace. The whistleblowers receive occupational detriment. And there isn't really a plaintiff's bar to support whistleblowers to kind of test that law. So Department of Justice has sort of thrown all the issues into a research paper. Uh, there won't be new legislation before this parliament. And maybe we'll be, hopefully we won't be back to square one this time next year. Um, so then that brings me to um, just touching on two other areas in Gary's comments. One on the anti-corruption agency. You will see there was a very lively debate this week in the Daily Maverick between Mr. Advocate Paul Hoffman and the Deputy Minister of Justice, John Jeffries, on um, you know, whether the ID bill is going to be constitutional or not. Uh, Paul Hoffman, the author of the Glenister uh, uh, litigation, has a very particular view on what's required. Um, Gary mentioned there is a reference group at the National Advisory Council against corruption looking at this issue of the institutional architecture. Um, I sat in a meeting of theirs last week. I'm part of that reference group. I don't think we're gonna see, uh, I think we'll be lucky if we see a recommendation before the end of the year. Again, we're not gonna see a white paper. We're not gonna see new legislation. And, and you know, if you go back to Paul Hoffman and if you believe in constitutional jurisprudence, then certainly the Glenn's certification still holds and there is a requirement for South Africa to have some kind of independent anti-corruption agency in line with the Jakarta principles, in line with the UNCAC, in line with our obligations in terms of the Bill of Rights. Um, but that debate still, still is, is very much alive. Um, you know, those who advocate for a multi-agency approach will say that it's uh, more resilient in terms of possible capture. But, you know, again, going back to the critique of the commission, as, as a vehicle. The challenge that we have in the criminal justice system is these handoffs that happen in the process. So the Financial Intelligence Center receives, uh, 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 you know, they may, may or may not receive suspicious transaction reports from the banks. What do they do with that information? Do they hand it over to, do they hand it over to, what, what is the standard of proof that's required by in the elite police force to then act on it and initiate investigation? We have these kind of gates and gaps within the criminal justice system, which, which impedes the ability to push for accountability. Which then leads me to my last point uh, prior to just talking about what Corruption Watch is thinking about doing, which is how do we break this cycle? You know, um, 
And, and there was a recommendation from the Zonda Commission, which the judge spoke about at the uh, uh, HSRC meeting, which hadn't received a lot of attention. And that's the recommendation for a permanent anti-state capture committee in parliament. Zonda said a permanent anti-state capture committee would ensure continuous accountability. If parliament is unable to protect the interests of the people, if there is an attempt at another state capture, who will protect the people? There should be a standing anti-state capture and anti-corruption commission that works the same way as the commission that I was honored to chair, which can call on anybody, whether it's the president or any member of parliament or minister to come and answer questions where there are allegations of corruption and state capture. This is a very interesting recommendation. Parliament's not touching it. The president hasn't really commented on it. It's about building the idea of the uh, uh, commission of inquiry, hardwiring that into the system. Uh, I don't know if the parliament can do it, uh, but this idea that anybody could be called and we kind of going to constantly watch state capture because we haven't turned a corner on state capture. And there's some, there's something in the public display of the hearings, which gives confidence that something is happening. Um, it could lead to fatigue uh, if nothing happens, but if those public hearings were to happen continuously and the public knew that these issues were under interrogation, I have some confidence that that could lead to better investigations and a more fluid criminal justice system. So then lastly, uh, on some of the key activities for Corruption Watch and civil society, it's continuing in our anti-corruption advocacy aligned to and in support of the Zonda Commission recommendations, uh, a particular and dedicated focus on enhancing whistleblower protection and support and on procurement reform, a critical participation within the National Advisory Council Against Corruption, uh, engaging in monitoring work in terms of uh, a legislation tracker, and I think also a private sector tracker. So all the different uh, private companies that have been listed that haven't been debarred or blacklisted, trying to follow up on, on where we are with that. And then my last point is on the role that we can play in engaging with regional and international partners. Internationally, there's a lot of interest in, this, in, in the work of the Sondra Commission. It's internationally, it's seen as a victory for the rule of law, somehow that the rule of law held in South Africa. There are colleagues from Transparency International at a recent meeting or from Georgia. They described the situation in Georgia as being in the grips of state capture without a commission of inquiry anywhere on the horizon. Um, so, I mean, it, so there's important lessons for us to teach and, and also lessons for us to learn. Regionally, there's a lot of work for us to, to be, to, there's a lot of work to be done on tracking and tracing illicit financial flows and how these networks work with, uh, recently with the Al Jazeera documentary on the gold mafia, how these uh, illicit financial flows are linked to uh, precious, precious metal smuggling and illicit tobacco, and how some of the same uh, networks and so-called laundry mats that the Guptas used are being used by individuals at large now, uh, some of whom are based in South Africa and have actively been involved in capturing particularly the states in Zimbabwe. I'd like to leave it there. Thank you, Karam. And to all our speakers, just incredibly rich inputs. And just this is where we're at right now, hot off the press with people who know and are monitoring it. And it does raise a number of questions, which is what originally this seminar was, is like, what can researchers do um, with this information and with this incredibly rich archive? And it's quite disturbing on some level to sort of realize the limitations in terms of the impact of researchers on policy reform, because we're back to the issue of political will. And then we have a constitutional democracy, which of course is going to have an election, hopefully. And we had a, yesterday, I want to say it might be the last real election because of artificial intelligence and deep fakes and who's actually talking and what's what. So, you know, there's so many 
areas for research, which the Rondo Commission opens up. But because we started five minutes late, I'm going to take the liberty just to extend our session beyond two o'clock for five minutes, just to open it up, because it's really the start of a conversation. Um, but if there's anyone online or if there's anyone in the room who wants to make an input or a comment, yeah. please, Brian, do this Brian or talk. I want to lay this three issues about around understanding corruption, the theoretical framework. Have you thought of is is the South African situation comparative to the broader post colonial politics of, of the continent? Is there a particularity and are there similarities? Mm -hmm. And for me, there are similarities and particularities. One is it's what's happening here is is uh, predictable for all post-colonial states, where the state becomes the center of accumulation for the new elite who don't have access to private sector accumulation. Here, the state is used for a new kind of accumulation, public resources, and especially of uh, placing people in place who can carry out those elite activities. And so any attempt legally we have accountability around placement, party placement is going to come up against this conflict of accumulation of the elite. And it's not just a legal issue, it's a central political accumulation problem that is, that is similar to all post colonial states. The, the, the difference here, of course, is still that you have a fairly independent judiciary, which is why this process was able to take place. And that has opened up a, a possibility of discussing alternatives, and that's critical. And that your election process is still fairly good, which will allow you to ask questions around this. But as I said, if you want to understand why the, the legal procedure is going to face limitations, is because of the state now is the center of accumulation for the states. And that's not peculiar to South Africa. The second thing is the original implications. The reason why the Ramaphosa response to the Zimbabwe election has been so similar to say the least is because of the crossover of corruption, is because of the fear of losing power within liberation movements. All liberation movements are facing this now. What happens if you lose the control of the state? What happens to your resources? What happens to your accountability? And that's the reason why the Al Jazeera issue is so important, is because there's this intersection of movement of resources now outside of public transparency, and it's making it even more dangerous. And that the future of even the elections here could have a real impact on the future of elections here in South Africa. If this is the problem, of course, with SADAC, SADAC structures are very weak. They have the they have a legal uh, process in place, but they don't have the, the structure to move unless particular countries take a lead. And in the, in the past ones, in Bangladesh, South Africa has taken that lead. It's not doing so this time around. In fact, I, my, my sense is that Zambia is likely to get isolated in this debate on the future of the Zimbabwe elections because uh, Mnangawa was due to become head of SADAC next year. The, 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 the uh, organ of politics, there's only the other people on there, the GRC in Namibia, are close to Zimbabwe. There's so many elections coming up on the continent. They're going to worry what Sada, if this report goes through, what will, what will it mean for their own elections, which are likely to be problematic. And that's linked to this issue of control of the state. So, my last point is how do people at uh, at ground level, understand corruption. Why is there so little interest in the in the Kuzanda Commission? Is it perhaps because there's ways in which corruption help people to survive at local level, and therefore they themselves have concerns about how this might affect local forms of survival strategy through corrupt methods? 
and therefore corruption at the elite level can begin to buy legitimacy at local level and therefore affect the manner in which it's constructed as a political narrative, especially if it's confined to legal issues where people will say, yeah, okay, that's a legal question. What's going to be doing our survival? How do we deal with this as a survival strategy? And how are parties articulating this issue at local level, local government level, at election level? And so, yeah, just think that's one way. Thanks, Brian. It's always fascinating and to contextualize it. And I, mean, I, I was wondering if the HSLC, particularly on people's local understanding of corruption, if you had a response how that was understood in your survey. I don't know if you want to pick up on that. Yeah. But when I had to buy on the shelf from the one to grind out of them, yeah. it's very interesting that, that do we have an agreement about what corruption is in itself? That's it's very important. I can't hear if you're an example of land in Mozambique as an example where I saw a kind of slogan in Mozambique that says go steal where they are tied up. So they're tied up there, so they have to eat somewhere. Okay, and we have this kind of uh, slogan in, in, in Ethiopia as well. Who he had never, if when he is hired, regrets when he is fired. This, and this is, yeah. not, uh, this is not a political narrative. This is yeah. historical and, and the awareness of the people, they are asking that you're going to eat, so you're going to support your family. And uh, as of this in Kenya, I read about, about um, it's our turn to eat. Yeah. And this is in Ethiopia, that is happening when Ali and the Kendall Power said that all of them said that no, it's our turn to eat. And we start to believe that yes, it's their turn to eat. So do we have an awareness about what is corruption in the first place? Because the findings were very interesting to see the awareness of the people about, about that corruption. So it's very interesting that Brian said about the political narrative, the legal narrative. But we also have the historical and the, the perception of the people about what corruption is itself. Anyone want to respond? Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everyone, and really for, for your amazing presentations and all the work that you're doing. Um, I must say, although it does uh, fill us with, uh, you know, a lot of um, anxiety, concern, and sometimes just pessimism about the future, but I think that you, you've got to look at the bright side. So one of the things I, I, I take from uh, the comments you, you've made, Karan, is that, that, that um, you know, the, the commission sometimes is criticized at home by people, but when you think about it and look at it from the outside, you know, you see that which country in the world, you know, in the same one, <laughs> that has been able to critique itself with such depth and tenacity and if you watch some of those uh, interviews that you can see on TV between Zondo and the president, and how tough they were, which other country would have tolerated it? So there are some things we should still be happy about and proud of in this country. And it tells us that there's still space to do the work that we're doing and to take it further. So I think it's a tremendous store of uh, knowledge. Um, and uh, insight about this country, which will take many years to understand. So uh, to for the researchers uh, who are amongst us in this house here, yeah, we, we're very keen to explore that uh, a lot more. And uh, we don't have a lot of capacity in the school, but we're building it up. And we, the only way we can do something useful is to do it with you <laughs> and in collaboration with you. So I want to say a few things about um, um, just my impressions of the, the, the research you've done on attitudes. Uh, I must say, I, I was disturbed by the fact that so many people really don't know or uh, don't want to know <laughs> uh, any of the commission. I mean, it's on, almost over 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it is disturbing. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, research uh, methodology problem. Uh, the research um, is a bit colorless, if you, you know, to use a pun. <laughs> I don't have a sense of who 
are these people? You know, uh, uh, what what are you know what is their class position? What is their status in life? What what is informing them? So uh, there's comments about you know cultural and other uh, perceptions or perspectives. You know, we don't get that sense of what is really happening. So I think Brian's point is that where there's a huge uh, space for us to research is to do the political economy analysis. So we understand better why did we get it in the first place? You know, how did we, how was it possible for these guys to turn for a whole country, just not a few individuals, we would be really mistaken if we thought a few people, you know, well, as we thought earlier, until you see the depth and the scope of, of corruption in the country, you know, uh, and from the work we, you know, Brian and others are doing there and, and bringing to us from across the continent, you see that, uh, and, and the world, we have researchers in, in, in Latin America, in Asia. Uh, so this is a global phenomenon. And uh, there's, there's a lot to learn from other countries about, you know, the insights about why. And, and so I think that that's an area of research we, we can only do if we do it uh, collaboratively, because it requires multidisciplinary approaches, bringing the sort of research you're doing, but then adding to that, you know, the depth, uh, more, you know, sort of qualitative, in-depth interviews with uh, people and trying to understand better, you know, why why we got here. So I, I take that. I think some of the proposals uh, that come out of the Commission on Institution uh, Building, uh, those are very important. Um, and, you know, a number of those are about how we can strengthen our democracy, make it more resilient. And because the institutions have been very weak and we're learning <laughs> about where those weaknesses are and where we can strengthen. So that's what we can do with the monitoring part of the work. And I think some of the areas are more about the constitutional framework of the country, the, some of the proposals that go to, you know, how the state and party work, for example, but even issues about uh, about the independence of, uh, of the civil service. Uh, it's a constitutional question. Uh, a, it's a policy question. And, uh, and I think there is a lot of work to do, um, learn from international experience, um, but also trying to get more um, support for that um, from constituencies in the country. So thank you very much, all of you, very for coming to, uh, to the school. And uh, I will follow up. Thanks, Raul. And I mean, I, the school is also has students and postgraduate researchers and masters and PhDs. And so this is an opportunity for, you know, as this work continues, there is this extraordinary archive and all of these networks. And I think the message of, of collaboration between civil society, state funded research organizations, universities is, is really important. And you know, the, the work of, I was particularly struck by a, a fascinating case of corporate corruption, the EOH case, which um, is, I think, a model for how one can develop teaching cases, because you want to harvest this for the academy as well. And the way I really want to alert you to this EOH corporate corruption case, because it just showed the granularity, the complexity, and it could draw from the sort of archive already of the state capture. So there's very many stories to be told, um, all sorts of approaches to be used. And I think collectively we, we've got our work cut out for us. So, I'd like to wrap this up. Just any brief final responses from our speakers. Maybe I'm not sure if Nani is online or if people in the room. Any last thoughts? I'm yeah, online. I'll, I'll leave it to my final final Go ahead. Can we hear you, Nani? Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Any last thoughts? Yeah, no, no I just said I'm online, but I'll leave it to my colleagues to answer. <laughs> <laughs>
so well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure we have the answers, Nadia, but I, I, I think they're the right questions. Um, actually, when I was at a conference in Zambia in 2005, Professor Fred Matessa, that I was presenting on neopatrimonial politics in his, in his country, and afterwards, uh, Professor Fantu Cheru from American University and I were chatting about it, and we, we were talking about the South African case and thinking how, you know, we can't foresee it happening here. And just in those 15 or so years since, you know, I, I think just the scale and pace of the state capture project is uh, just overwhelming. And I think it raises the questions that Brian and others are talking about. Um, I think your points about what might be the uh, particularities, I think the independent judiciary is key. I am worried about a sustained attack on the judiciary and how that is having a bearing on the public opinion around the judiciary. And we are seeing it come through. Narnia has done recent work to showcase in that scale of decline in trust. So I think it, that those attacks are worrisome. Um, the electoral process next year, we're very worried. We do a lot of work for the uh, we, we do a lot of research for the electoral commission, and we are worried about the character of what twenty four is going to be. Um, AI and chatbots and all that, notwithstanding. So, um, I think just uh, one or two comments about um, the low level of awareness. I mean, Nani and I have had a long conversation about this. And we're, what we're planning to do is actually have a transversal look at our attitudinal data from two decades and look at all attitudinal uh, knowledge questions and understand where does awareness of the Gondor Commission stack up. Um, it is alarmingly low given the high visibility of, of, of say, capture and the Commission's proceedings. Um, I tend to think we're a low information society. It's not often. We talk about ourselves and we think we know a lot at, in, in sort of our professional circles, but we are a low information society. So exposing that more is what we need. We're planning to do at the HSRC as a follow-up um, investigation. Just one thing about um, people at ground level and understanding of corruption. I think we don't know enough about that. We are actually, we've just started a three-year engagement with support from GIZ and DPME, looking at uh, social norms around corruption. So we're in the field now with the first module trying to probe understandings, norms, and that could provide us more answers than we have currently. So Gary might want to talk and Napelli a bit more about that. Um, but it is the right question. I don't think uh, we have a good a read of what the public's multiple definitions of corruption are. And GIZ has been pushing us on that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Briefly, yeah. I just want to contribute on the matter of uh, corruption in Africa. And um, what we are finding is that initially there was a sense of South African exceptionalism, where we often feel that, as Ben said, we don't see it happening in the country. Um, however, Jean Francois was brought in 1989. Um, in the book, The States of Africa, wrote this book where he argued that um, patronage and patrimonial activities in Africa should not be tackled from a barbarian system because a lot of it is tied to cultural practices that um, are prevalent in the continent. And the rise of the big man is essentially going to forever facilitate um, corruption within uh, the African continent. So the methods of tackling corruption need to differ. And on the point of whether or not uh, citizens justify it as a, maybe as a means to an end, um, there are theoretical foundations on, on that. Uh, we see the real theory, for example, argues that um, corruption is viewed as a, as a means to an end. Um, however, in previous studies that we've done, um, South Africans seem to be quite um, confident in, in, in speaking out against corruption. So for example, when we started seeing the rise of state capture around 2016-17, we began to see increased concerns from a public opinion standpoint on corruption. So we had what we call the top three problems, South Africa indicator. And before 2017, corruption was in a top three concern. However, since then, it's consistently become a top three concern. So there is a recognition. And even within the open-ended data we're analyzing, um, whilst his knowledge is a bit circumscribed, the concerns regarding lack of accountability come through. So South Africans, those who, who have knowledge, do seem very concerned. And there isn't maybe a sense of 
but this is okay. There are serious concerns, and the frustration comes from the lack of accountability. Thanks. Gary, briefly. Um, yeah, thank you. Just uh, two points. I think one about uh, say that and your comment that it's the data that have been coming in. Um, they, they, it, it, it is a nationally representative um, survey sample. So class and race and education and all of those um, subgroup analyses um, have data captured so, um, because it is a representative survey. So that, that, that will come out, that does inform every survey. The other thing is uh, the breaking news that nine years ago to be to the student union has been arrested for the Basalfa corruption. So you'll see where that goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the social norms research that we're doing is actually a third point. Um, we're looking at it, we're trying to be a little bit creative. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at, at it um, from the perspective, for example, of women's experience of it. Um, and women's response to it, and the same we're asking you, uh, are their attitudes different? Um, and we're looking at you know, urban rural, those kinds of things as well. So I think it's a, it's a fascinating thing that, uh, well, uh, let's see what the data tell us. Uh, the idea, I think, is really exciting, exciting to be involved in, and thanks to GIZ for pushing us and telling us. Yeah. Good, because yeah. these things cost money. Yeah. 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 Finally, Karan. Thank you. Well, one last, very minor point on the question of the resilience and relative health of the democracy. And I, I think it is important also to just give independent uh, investigative journalism its, its due its credit. Um, you know, when <laughs> Bianca Goodman or somebody walks into your office with a to buy to uh, leaks, um, you know, what do you do with it? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, and the, the, the way the media dealt with the, the, the couple of leaks, mm -hmm. the, 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 we've got the multi leaks now, uh, that has been progressive and responsible, important, but it's that I think also closing that gap between that group and the academy mm -hmm. and then also law enforcement. Yeah. Because you know, if you don't have a condition of inquiry, it's, you're in the realm of allegations, uh, and there's a big gap between allegations and evidence that can be used in court. So um, I think I think it's something that's uh, a real credit to the country and, and, and speaks to the resilience of our current uh, constitutional order. Yeah. So thanks everyone. I mean, there's lots to discuss and we're going to have more brown bags in the democratic governance theme and use the SENU. And for I just want to thank all our participants for online um, for clicking with us and in person, you get treated to a lunch. There is a free lunch here. Um, but also the behind the scenes, you know, um, our speakers, you know, you, you really did the work to show up, to prepare, but you know the, the the support from our team at the Mandela School, particularly Petunia, um, Timbella, Valeska, Wendy, Kelvin, really want to recognize them after for putting this on the agenda for as a theme. And so really thanks to everyone for coming and to be continued. There is work to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yes, no, and collaboration. I mean, that is what is, is the word, what we need to do. So thanks very much. On a Friday afternoon, enjoy your weekend. All the best. Bye, everyone. And the presentations can be made available. We'll do a follow up for those who are interested. So thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.